Thank you, Coach. Good morning, guys. A little bit better than that. Come on, good morning. Like Coach said, my name is Matt Kubler. Um, the reason I'm here today is not necessarily to give you more information on bullying. The reason I'm here today is to help create a solution to a problem. Bullying's been around for a long time. I, you're going to hear a story, and that story's going to go back to when I was eight years old. I'm 44 now. So as you can tell, bullying, the problem of bullying has not been solved. I believe that I have at least one component to solving that problem. We're going to talk more about that later. My job is not to create another Band-Aid to a gaping wound. My job is to give you guys a tool that you can use to help solve the problem one kid at a time. We're not going to come and wave a magic wand over bullying and make it disappear. But we are going to give you a tool today that you can hopefully use at least one time in your life to be a leader. That's the goal, to be a leader. I believe that is what is the solution to a lot of problems. We are not creating leaders anymore. We're creating Band-Aids, and I'm tired of it. I want everybody in this room to be inspired to go out and be a leader when this 40-minute class is over. So the first slide here, it's about who am I? Who is Matt Kubler, and why does he care so much about bullying? I'm 44 years old, like I said. My daughter Rebecca is, eight, is 17. She's in 11th grade here at Spring Ford. My son Andrew is in 6th grade. I was born and raised in Pottstown. My dad left when I was 9 months old, and my mom had to work three jobs for the majority of my life in order to provide for my brother and I. We didn't live in very nice places. We lived where we could afford. A lot of times that was in low-income housing. In those developments where we lived, the kids were not always very nice. My brother Andy was three years older than me. Andy had severe learning disabilities. Now back then in the 1970s and 80s, you were either normal or mentally retarded. Unfortunately, my brother was classified as mentally retarded. If he were alive today, he would be considered autistic with ADHD. We would never call somebody who's autistic Retarded today, would we? No. At least I hope not. But back when we were growing up, everybody, every day that we came in contact with, especially the kids, called my brother a bunch of names, one of which was retard, one of which was idiot, moron, stupid, and they made fun of him relentlessly every single day. How many people have heard somebody stutter before? I want you to close your eyes real quick. Think about the first time you heard that person stutter. Imagine what they looked like, what they sounded like, and how you felt individually when you heard it for the first time. Now I want you to multiply that by a million, and that's what my brother was like. You can open your eyes. My brother stuttered so profusely, in my lifetime I've never heard anybody stutter as bad as my brother did. My brother couldn't say complete sentences. His face would contort, when I say contort, I mean it would move in shapes that I didn't know the face could move in. His eyes would roll into the top of his head. His eyelids would flutter. So imagine being called a moron or a retard every single day and then adding in something that made you look even more awkward and weird when you tried to speak. Imagine being my brother for one second and imagine living that every single day of your life. My brother was three years older than me. By the time I was eight or nine years old, I ended up switching roles and becoming the older brother. My brother just wasn't cognitively at the age that he was. So I had to step in and become the older brother. Whenever he would get made fun of, I only knew one way to handle that, and that was to punch them in the face. Now, today we know there's a lot better ways to handle things like that. Back then, that was the only way I knew, and it was the only way I knew that would work. And quite frankly, the only thing I cared about was the fact that if I was getting my butt kicked, which happened every single day, my brother wasn't getting made fun of. Because the people that would normally make fun of my brother were kicking my butt. So to me, that was a win. My brother was given a break from being picked on during the time in which I was getting my butt kicked. It's the only way I knew how to handle it. Now, while I did spend a lot of time fighting on behalf of my brother, I also spent a lot of time fighting just because I like to fight. And I still kind of like to fight to this day. It's a passion of mine, but I use it in a more constructive way. But I used to get in a lot of trouble because I would get into fights. 
And I also would get in a lot of trouble to the point where the police would be involved. One time when I was 13, an officer by the name of Chris Carlisle, who was a police officer in Pottstown, arrested me for being an idiot, which happened a lot, took me down to the police station, and instead of throwing the book at me, he gave me a break. Because he saw something inside of me. He saw what inside of me? It begins with the letter P. Passion? Well, I did have passion, but not that. Potential. potential. What is potential? Anybody know what po the definition of potential? It's like ability to be something more. It's an unmet ability, right? You haven't yet done it. That's why it's potential. Not everybody reaches their potential. Not everybody achieves everything that they're able to achieve for whatever reason. Officer Carlisle saw potential in me. So instead of throwing the book at me, he decided he was going to become an influencer in my life. So during the times when I would normally go out and be an idiot, when my mom was at one of her three jobs, he would come and get me and my brother and we'd go play basketball. So he took me out of a situation where I was always finding myself having negative things happen to me and put me in a situation where he could control and put me in a positive situation. Unbeknownst to me at that time, I was becoming a mentee to a mentor. Do we know what a mentor is, right? Somebody, raise your hand. Yep, they do that. What else? They look out for him. What else? They teach, absolutely. They lead the other person. They lead the other person. They're a good example. All those things are true. To me, a mentor is somebody who you, the person who's being mentored, does not want to let down. I don't want to disappoint my mentor because I want to emulate him. I want to be like him because he is the person that is showing me how to become a better version of me. He'll come back into play in a minute here. So I was a pretty smart kid, I'm, uh, even though I was an idiot at times and I got myself in some trouble and I liked to fight, I was smart. I was in the gifted program in school. I did very well on my SATs. I was in the National Honor Society. I finished in the top ten of my class and I had a four-year scholarship offer to attend the United States Coast Guard Academy, which is like West Point or the Naval Academy except for the Coast Guard. But I was also a rebel as you can tell by the fact that I was going out and getting into fights. I didn't deal well with people telling me what to do, and I certainly didn't deal well with authority, which is kind of weird in the position I am today. But back then, I didn't. So when I turned 18, I said, I'm going to be a man, and I'm going to do something that men do, and that's make my own decisions. So when I was 18, I enlisted in the Army. Now, it was a very momentous occasion. I felt very proud of myself, but at no point in time did I intend on going in the Army. I was still planning on going to the Coast Guard Academy. But one thing I learned real quickly and I haven't done ever since is that if you don't do your homework and take calculated risks, meaning you don't think everything through, you're going to find yourself paying the penalty for that. So when I decided to enlist in the Army, I didn't do my homework. I didn't think about the repercussions, the pros and cons of what that decision would have. And it turns out that when you enlist in the Army, it negates any, any agreement you have with any of the service academies. If you listen to the Air Force or any of the other branches as well. So when I thought I was going to be able to make a choice, I found out the choice was made for me, that when I enlisted in the Army, it was the Army it was going to be. So instead of spending four years in college and going to the Coast Guard Academy, I enlisted and spent four years in the Army. I don't know where I would have ended up had I gone to college and been through the Coast Guard Academy. I'm pretty sure I'd probably end somewhere near the same place, but probably maybe with a little bit of an easier path but I can't change that and I don't regret anything I did because I did it and I learned from it. So I went into the Army, but let's back up first. Growing up, my, brother was, my mother was told that my brother would always be dependent upon her. My brother would never move out of the house. My brother would never graduate high school. He would never drive a car. He would never get a job any of those things. Remember my brother was three years older than me. I graduated high school in 1989. My brother, he graduated in 1988, year before me. Albeit he was 20 years old when it happened, but he never gave up and he never quit. 
because he wanted to prove those that said he couldn't wrong. That same year, my brother got his driver's license and bought his first car, a 1979 white VW Rabbit four-door. I remember it very well. Stick shift. My brother also got his first full-time job. He worked at a um, senior, a Mennonite senior center, was a janitor. So I graduated that following year in June. On July 12, 1989, my brother died in a car accident. And you may be wondering right now, was he supposed to be driving? Did he really have the wherewithal and the mental ability to drive safely? And the answer is yes. My brother wasn't mentally retarded. He had a brain. He drove safely. The reason why he died had nothing to do with his driving ability. It had to do with a medical occurrence that happened inside of his body that caused him to go unconscious prior to the accident. He went unconscious, swerved into the oncoming lane of traffic, and died. If my brother could relive his life over again and make, be given the same choices to make all over again, I can guarantee you that he would choose to drive that day, even if he knew he was going to die. So I went in the Army a month after he died. I was stationed in Germany, beautiful country. I was there for three years, and I served a tour in the first Gulf War. We've all heard about the first Gulf War, right? 1990-91, Saddam Hussein in Iraq invade Kuwait. We didn't like that, so we told them to get out, and it took about 100 hours till they said, you're right, and they put their hands up and quit. It was a pretty quick war, not like the one we've been in for the last 13 years over in the Middle East. I got out of the Army in 1993. A few months later, I became a police officer in the borough of Royersford. Who lives in Royersford? I love Royersford. Great little town. Who here remembers their parents or anybody else talking about the tornado that came through Royersford in 1994? Anybody live in the hamlet? No? All right. Well, I was on duty that night in the borough of Royersford in my police car, and I was sitting at the light at 5th and Main where Giovanni's Pizza is. Great pizza, by the way. Back then, it wasn't Giovanni's Pizza, it was a carpet store. But I'm sitting at the red light, and it had been raining all night, and it was storming, just a normal storm. And my partner was on the radio talking to me about this tornado he'd heard about on the radio, and it was coming from the Chester County area. Well, I'm at the light, and all of a sudden, the rain stops. So I turn my windshield wipers off, and then about 10 seconds later, it was like a wave of water came over top of my car. And it was so thick that the windshield wipers was doing nothing. I couldn't see anything on anywhere outside of the car. And I'm thinking, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. And about five seconds later, I felt my car land. And when I say land, I mean land. Apparently, I was picked up in that tornado and moved two and a half blocks. Because I thought I was sitting at the light of Fifth and Main with my foot on the brake. By the time I felt my car land, I was in the middle of the 700 block of Main Street facing the opposite direction with my tires rammed up inside my car and a telephone pole and a tree on top of my car. And the woman screaming out her window from her house asking me what happened. All I had the, the, the courage to say was look up because she didn't have a roof. So that was pretty weird um, to say the least. And that was my first year as a police officer. So I kind of set the bar high when it came to the excitement level that I could have expected as a police officer. I've been a cop for 23 years, and I've tried very hard to match that, that excitement level I, had, level I had that first year, but I've never been able to do it. And I'm kind of glad. I'm not going to lie to you. That was, a, that was one of those once-in-a-lifetime things, and I'm pretty sure my brother had a lot to do with the fact that I was not injured during that day. I went on to become a SWAT officer, an instructor and team leader on the SWAT team. That was obviously fun. Everybody knows what SWAT does, kicking in doors, serving warrants, catching drug dealers all that kind of stuff. That was fun. But then 9-11 happened. We all know what happened on 9-11, right? 9-11, one of the days that made me more angry than anything else in the world. I'm a very patriotic man. I served my country. I fought in a war. I would die for the flag. I believe in everything our Constitution stands for. And it made me very angry when 19 terrorists decided to come into my country, take over U.S.-owned airplanes, and fly them into three buildings and crash into the 
the ground at Shanksville, Pennsylvania. We lost 3,000 plus people that day, and it made me very angry, so I decided to do something about it. On 9-12, President Bush went on TV stating that he was reenacting a program which had been defunct called the United States Federal Air Marshal Program. I applied for that job, as did several hundred thousand other people. The number of people they hired is classified, but I can tell you it's somewhere around 4,000. And I was one of the 4,000 that got hired. I feel very proud that I beat out several hundred thousand other people who thought that they wanted to do that job as well. So for the next four and a half years, I served as a federal air marshal flying on commercial airlines owned by the United States all over the world, protecting them from terrorism. 4,238 flights. That's how many flights I flew in four and a half years. That's a lot of flights. Imagine every day getting up and flying to Florida four different times. Every day. That's how many flights I flew. Number three, you'll see I'm a body language and human behavior, behavior expert. What does that mean? Anybody know what that is? You determine what, like, trying to like, determine if someone's like, lying or not by like, their facial expressions or their emotions. Exactly. I'm able to read body language, meaning your facial expressions, micro movements in your face, your eyes, your mouth, corners of your eyes, your forehead, inflections in your voice, how you sit and stand. I'm able to tell whether or not you're telling me the truth, whether you're happy or sad, angry or not. And then I can also, after a little bit of a conversation, determine the type of personality that you have, which will then allow me to get a better picture of who you are as a person. And it's helped me out a lot in my career in police work, obviously. Now, it doesn't tell me what the truth is. It just tells me whether or not someone's telling me the truth. And it's a gift that I have. And I say it's a gift because I believe 100% that I got that gift from my brother. Go back to my childhood. Imagine living with someone who can't speak but yet they need to tell somebody something. My brother had a very difficult time relaying information to anyone about what he needed, what he wanted, or when he needed it. I was able to interpret that. Don't ask me how or why, but as a kid I was very good at that. I knew what my brother wanted, and he would always say, thanks, bro. He could always get that out. Whenever I said it right, he would say, thanks, bro. I didn't know that I was good at that because of him, until many years later. But I'm very thankful that I do know that now and I thank him every day that I had that ability. And then you'll see number four that I also began mentoring teens in 1995. I told Officer Carlisle when I became a police officer that I was gonna help someone else just like he helped me. And it wasn't a plan to do this for the rest of my life but it was a plan to do it at least once. And in 1995 I arrested a kid when I was in Royers Ford who had LSD on him and we all know LSD is a hallucinogenic drug and it is a very dangerous drug. This kid had LSD on stamps, and he had a lot of stamps. It would have been a very serious charge against him. But after talking to him for a little bit, I realized he had what? Potential. Potential. While he was acting like an idiot, and he made stupid mistakes, I could sense that he really was a good kid at heart, and that he had something else to offer. Now, he was not necessarily pleased with the fact that he was going to have to spend time with me every week in the beginning but he became to appreciate it more as we spent more time together. Today, he's a professor. He has three kids. He's been married for 20 years. I lie. He's been married for 17 years. And we still meet every year, at least one time a year, to catch up. And every year, he thanks me for introducing me to him as his mentor, not as the police officer that could have ruined his life by putting charges on him and putting him in the system because there's no telling where he would have ended up if that was the way I'd, I'd decided to go with him. Since then, I've mentored over 100 kids, and it's one of the greatest joys I have in my life is when I get a chance to do that. As Coach said, I am the co-founder and co-owner of Max Out. While we do three different things at Max Out, the one I'm most proud of is the leadership and mentorship program. We also do strength training program that you've never seen before, an athletic-based training that will get you better prepared for athletics, but the thing that I think is the greatest thing that we do is we provide leadership and mentorship training to each and every kid that comes into Max Out. The reason I'm here today was inspired because of what we do at Max Out. I know not everybody here is ever going to come to Max Out. I get that. I'm not here to sell you on Max Out. What I'm here to do is provide to you what we do in our four walls at Max Out in your school. I know that in order to help create a world full of leaders, I can't limit it to just the four walls of Max Out. I needed to bring it to you. 
So thankfully, Springford is a progressive school district, and when broached with this idea, they said yes. So I'm here today to give you a piece of what we do at Max Out. And I hope to do this many, 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 many more times. And you may hear me every year with a different program. You may hear me next year in ninth grade. My goal is to do this as frequently as possible to help kids become leaders. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. What is a bully? We all know about the bullying problem. We can all pretty much name somebody who is a bully. There are two main kinds of bullying. Number one, there's the in-person kind, which is pretty obvious, right? Everybody's seen that once or twice. But the one that didn't exist when I was a kid is cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is the thing I think that changed the game of bullying altogether. Why is cyberbullying so much worse than in person? They can always harass you. Very good. Anybody else? There's one thing I'm really thinking of. You can't get away. You can't get away. Similar to that, but not exactly. They can be anonymous. Very true. They can be anonymous. Read it like over and over again. Absolutely. Can't get rid of it. Yep. They're not in front of your face. Yeah, that goes back to the anonymous. The, they, can, they can hide. What about this? Everyone can see it. If I come up to you at your locker and I start intimidating you, that's pretty much a one-on-one -on -one conversation, right? But if I intimidate you on your page on, on Instagram or Twitter, and everybody that's following me and everybody that's following you can see that, and then they can like or share or retweet, and then everybody that's on their pages can like or share or retweet, and they can do that over and over an infinitum, everyone can see it. So what turned into a singular in-person event now it turns into a shared event by thousands. And no matter how many times you delete that from your page, someone else is seeing it, which causes you more and more pain over and over again. That's why cyberbullying is so horrible. There's two words that I want to use to describe a bully. Number one, they're cowards. Why are they cowards? Who can answer that question? Why is a bully a coward? Think about what that word means. They pick on the weak, absolutely. Who else? The anonymity part of it, right? That means they, they don't want to face the person they're, they're making fun of. Who else? How about this? They're cowards because they're afraid to face themselves. They're afraid of who they are inside. They're afraid of their own inabilities or their inadequacies. So much so that they try to find joy or some sense of purpose by hurting others instead because they're afraid to face who they are. Secondly, I think they're weak. Why are they weak? I'm not talking bench pressing 300 pounds. I'm talking mentally and emotionally weak. Why? <coughs> Absolutely. It goes back to being a coward, right? If they are afraid to face who they are, that means they can't handle it, which makes them weak. So every time that we give power to a bully, we're giving power to a coward who is weak. By themselves, they have no power. Yet when we become victims instead of victors, we give them power. And I'm going to tell you in a second how we fight that. What is a leader? Give me a definition or, or a word that describes leader. I put four up on the board there. Brave, smart, courage, strong. Give me some other words that describe what you believe a leader is. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Direct. Direct, absolutely. Wise. Wise. Friendly. Friendly. Dependent. dependent. Independent? No, it's independent. They're dependable. Supportive. Supportive. I got a definition for you, and I think you'll like it. Here's what I believe a leader is, and it's something you can utilize every single day of your life and every aspect of your life and it will not change regardless of the situation you're in. A leader is this. A leader is a person who will selflessly give of themselves to someone else in order to help them achieve, to achieve success. A leader is a person who will selflessly give of themselves to another person in order to help them achieve success. How many people have seen somebody get bullied before? Keep your hands up. How many people have done something about that? Positive. 
interjected themselves in the situation. That's a lot of the class. Each and every one of you at that one moment in your life was a leader. Every one of you. Why? Because that was a situation that you weren't involved in, right? You weren't being bullied. Someone else was being bullied. And you said, I'm going to risk my own personal well-being. I will potentially become a target for that bully, but I don't care because I believe in that person more than I believe in myself. And I want to help that person more than I care about myself. And I want to put that person in a position where they can find success. So when you interjected yourself between the bully and the one being bullied, and you took that person out of that situation and put them in a situation that was safer for them, you helped that person at that very moment find success. At that moment, you were a leader. You can do that same exact psychological process that you went through in every aspect of your life, whether it's in school, whether it's in athletics, whether it's dealing with your family, whether it's at a job, at your profession when you get older, whether it's in college, whatever it is, interacting with anybody on any given time, you can do that same process and you will be a leader all the time. If you do it once a month, you'll be a leader once a month. If you do it 10 times a day, you'll be a leader every single day. And I can promise you this, you will never be a victim of a bully when you are a leader. Bullies have no time to waste on people like you if you're a leader. They want to go after the ones that are left behind, that don't have that self-confidence and don't have that belief in themselves. So everybody that decides that they want to be a leader will no longer be a victim. And for those that were left behind, who are still being targeted by bullies, if there's more leaders, they will be more people to help save those that were left behind. Does that make sense? It's a very simple, logical progression. And I can promise you, it works. I've been doing it my whole life. On the board, I put some professions where people are normally associated as being leaders. You have teachers, firemen, military, police, athletes, and business owners. One thing I want to clarify real quick. There's a difference between a leader and an influencer. Does that make sense? Give me an example of somebody who's an influencer. Parents. Parents. Friends. Friends. Think bigger. Celebrities. Celebrities. <clears throat> Politicians. <laughs> Dictators. Who else? What about the media? Just because somebody goes, I'm John Q. Public and I want you to buy this, and everybody goes out and buys it, does that make them a leader? By definition that we just created, does that make them a leader? No, that makes them an influencer. Because I can guarantee you that person that says go buy this product is benefiting somehow. He's just using his power to get you to do something that they want you to do. Not every influencer is a leader, but 100% of the time, every leader is an influencer. The upper right hand corner, who is that? Uh, nope. Steve, Jobs. Steve Jobs. Is Steve Jobs an influencer or a leader or is he both? Why is he both? Absolutely. So the story of Apple is Apple was in the toilet. It was going under many, many years ago. And Steve Jobs was brought in as the last ditch effort to try to save it. Well, we all know now how that story ended. Apple is probably the single most successful tech business in the world today. In order to save a business and bring it to the point where it's gotten to, you have to be an amazing leader. And how many people have something made by Apple either on them or at home? So I'm going to say that he probably was an amazing influencer as well. What is a leader? There's three different styles that we need to think about. Coach, what time is this class over? 20. 20? There's three styles. You have the quiet leader, the bold leader, and the supportive leader. The quiet leader is the person at practice on your sports team that works his butt off every single day just so that he can be the best that he can be. Might be a kid in school who you know studies the hardest 
asks questions in class, takes the best notes and always gets the best grades because they outwork everybody. That's what a quiet leader does. They lead by example. Bold leaders. Be more like me or Coach Rasich, maybe a military person, a person that you normally associate with the word leader. Somebody who's out in front, very uh, big and bold. That's why I use the word bold. But I think everybody in this room, if you don't fall in one of those two categories, will fall into the word, the, the, the group supportive leader. We talked about that. The supportive leader is the one that will step in and give selflessly of themselves to someone else to help them find success. When you gave support to the person who was being bullied, you became a leader at that very moment. How many people have a best friend? Have you ever given advice to a best friend who was having a bad day? Did that advice help them get through that moment? You were a leader. When your parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or siblings do that for you, they're being a leader. The problem is we're not associating those actions with the word leadership. That's where we're missing the boat. If we do those things all the time, if we're constantly trying to help others without wanting something in return for ourselves and helping them find success, we will then in turn find success for ourselves. Psychology of a bully. I can guarantee you every bully has some of these things going on in their life. They were probably victims of abuse on some level, either physical or mental. They certainly don't fit into any one particular social group. They have controlling personalities, which is what makes them influencers, which is what get them, gets them to have people follow them to do the same type of bullying tactics that they do every single day. They often come from a home where the parent is no longer present. And they may come from a home where a relative is potentially being abused. All these things can go into the psychology of what makes up a bully. Conversely, a leader is quite different, you can see. I can promise you this, as a leader myself, I will never, ever, 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 ever be outworked. I will never, ever, 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 ever fail. Why will I not fail? Tell me what the word fail means. Give up. Give up. What's another word for give up? Another word for give up. Quit. quit. I will never quit, therefore I will never fail. Why won't I quit? Because I'm a leader. But why intrinsically inside of me, what burns inside of me that says you will not quit? My passion. I know who I am. I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not good at. I am not going to do things that I'm not good at. So if I know that I'm good at something, and no matter how hard that might be to accomplish, I will do everything in my power to achieve that goal. If I mess up, I get up and I do it again. I make adjustments because I learn from my mistakes. I will never quit because I believe in my own ability to succeed. I will never be outworked. If you want the same thing I want, I'm going to outwork you because I want it more than you. I'm going to make sure of it. I work 100 hours a week so I can provide for my family at the level that I believe I should be providing for them. I work 100 hours a week so that I can come out and talk to you guys on my time because I care about you. I want you all to become leaders. I want every single one of you to be successful. And if today inspires one of you to go out and do something good for somebody else, then maybe you'll inspire that person to go do it to somebody else, and then so on, and so on, and so on. That's what this is all about. I will never fail because I will never quit. That's the mentality you have to have in life. I have a strong support system. My wife and kids allow me to do the things that I do because they believe in me. And I promised them that I would never let them down. And I hold myself to that every single day. I have positive role models in my life. People that I want to make happy. I don't want to disappoint. We talked about my strong work ethic. I'm compassionate. We know what compassion is, right? What's that mean? Compassion. Giving, caring. I care about others. Passion is what I believe in. I have a passion for what I do, but I have compassion for others. I have long-term goals. If you haven't started making plans today, you need to start making plans. My first job that I ever wanted to do in my life, I figured out when I was six. Guess what that was? 
I wanted to be the guy on the back of the trash truck holding on to the thing yelling, go to the driver. That was my first plan. I never did that. But that was my first plan. If you don't start a plan, you can't make changes to your plan. My plan has changed a billion times. But I started with one. And I keep making changes to it based on different things going on in my life. And I take calculated risk, meaning that I try to weigh the pros and cons of whatever it is I'm going to do. And if I believe I can do it, I'm going to go do it. So the question is, who do you want to be? You're not going to know that until you know who you are. This piece of paper you have on your desk is something for your parents to read. But on the back, I want you to write down five things that you are great at and five things that you are weak at. You're going to change this list thousands of times between now and the day that you die. But I want you guys to start somewhere. Look inside yourself and decide, am I good at something or am I weak at something? If you say I'm good at school, I'm going to say you're a liar. School's a building, not a thing you do. If you say I'm good at sports, I'm going to call you a liar because you're not good at every single sport ever created in the history of man. If you can throw a two-seam fastball and paint the corner of the plate, then you're good at throwing a fastball. It doesn't make you good at all of baseball. It just makes you good at a particular part of it. Be honest with yourself. I'm never going to be fast. Why? Because I'm slow. And I will always be slow. No matter how hard I try, my body's just not built to be fast. Quickly, friend watch. Who's heard of friend watch? Friend watch is that little owl sitting on your website, on the springford.net website. It's an anonymous reporting tool that you can use to let the school know exactly what's going on in your friends' lives. If there's something bad happening to a friend, go on friendwatch.org. Maybe somebody in the SAP team can help that kid out. If you do nothing, then you're not helping solve the problem. This is my website, maxoutstudio.com, if you want to learn more about that. I wrote a book. The coach talked about that. It's about my brother and my life growing up with my brother called A Brother's Love, A Memoir. If anybody would like a copy of that, you can order it online. If you would like me to sign that copy, friend me on uh, Instagram or Twitter, at MaxOutVP, and I'd be happy to sign a copy of the book for you. If you have any questions, need anything from me, if I can be a service to you in any way, you can reach me through Twitter or through MaxOutVP on Instagram. If you follow me, I will follow you back. Does anybody have any questions for me at all? Anything at all? Thank you very much. You were a great class. I hope today you were inspired to do something good for somebody else and that you all become leaders.